Heights Church. We're the church on Lime Street, that is. Um, if you're visiting or joining us by cable, we're glad that you're here and welcome to our church and our church family. If you would um, make time to tear off the visitor's um, piece in your bulletin, that's the way we record not only your presence, but also your prayer requests and the needs that you might have. If you need information, if you need a visit, if you have a particular prayer, whether you want it, our, our pastors to pray for you confidentially or if you want us to pray through our prayer ministry at this church, please take a moment and fill that out. We have so many exciting ministries going on this summer at Calhoun First, and if you've been able to watch um, a lot of those announcements have been scrolling through on our screen. We have a summer school lunch program. We're looking for additional volunteers. It's at 11 o'clock each, each day. If you have a little time to um, volunteer for that ministry, we would love to have you be a part of, of that ministry. We also have a back to school uh, program that Doug and Virginia Todd are leading. We're providing some clothes for children who are um, in need as they start their school uh, days back. We want to be a part of a, a good experience for all the children in our community. And speaking of that, tonight we start Vacation Bible School at 6 p.m. We need to always remember this isn't a babysitting service. Sometimes I think we think, oh, it's just lots of kids. This is about us sharing our faith with the children in our church and in our community. It's our way to pass on what the Lord has given us, our own faith. And um, we want to take time. We welcome anyone who would like to be a part of that ministry. It's a blessing. It's, it blesses us as, it much, as much as it blesses the children. We also have many others. One in particular I wanted to mention is Music on the Mountain, which is this coming Saturday from 6 to 8. Um, I think Heart and Soul will be singing as well as some other churches. This is a, a ministry, it's a, a boys' home that's here, very close to our community. Children who don't have homes, who have um, had to leave their homes for one reason or another. Um, there's music, it'll be time for us to worship and, and celebrate and also to give back through an offering um, while we're there. So consider having an evening with music on the mountains. One other announcement I'd like to make is that we're going to have a cross-country prayer. Um, this is July 23rd at 7 p.m. It's going to be in front of our sanctuary. Um, and it's a time when we will come together and publicly, corporately pray for our children, for our church, for our community. Um, and we welcome everyone to be there. And now as we come uh, to our fellowship chorus, Take a moment and look around you, and if you see someone you don't know, someone that's new, uh, welcome them to our church and to our church family. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Has promised good. 
Pledge energetic and engaging anthem. A special word of thanks to Dawn for her splendid assistance in our worship this morning. And a word of thanks to all of you for your being here as we gather for worship. You'll remember that some weeks ago, Brother Bob Daniel mentioned that our worship format for the services during August would be that of a camp meeting. In conjunction with that, uh, we're now enlisting and asking folks to consider giving a word of testimony during our three morning services each Sunday uh, during the month of August. So I'm asking you if you will prayerfully consider uh, your sharing your word of testimony. Five to seven minutes, we'll be having a person give a testimony in the 8.30 worship and in the 2.11 o'clock worship services. And I know that many of you have that testimony that can speak and connect meaningfully to all of us. I'm asking you, as you're inclined to give your testimony, to let me know so that we might schedule that Sunday in that particular service that you'll be sharing with our congregation. I look forward to hearing from you and sharing with you in our times of worship. The reading of Scripture this morning is taken from the New Testament from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. You will recognize this text to be what is commonly called the Great Commission. It contains the very last commission or commandment the Lord Jesus left to His church prior to His ascension. And so as you're able, if you would please stand for the reading and hearing of God's Word. Let us now hear the Word of God. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's bow together for a moment of prayer. Holy and righteous God, grant that we might have ears to hear. That Father God, through all the voices and the clamor of our busy culture, we might be attuned to your word. That we would be able to hear even that still small voice of God. And Father, as we discern your voice, as we hear your word, enable us to engage that word, to appropriate that word. And then Father, to share that word with our community and with our world. In our worship this morning, O oh God, we seek to honor you, to bring glory to your name, to bring encouragement to your church. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Some years ago, while serving another church, I had gone one Saturday afternoon to the Hartsfield Jackson International Airport in Atlanta. I had gone that Saturday afternoon to meet and to pick up a ministerial colleague from New Orleans. I had never met this gentleman in person, but over the course of several months, he and I had talked by phone and through correspondence. I had invited this gentleman to lead us in a special emphasis of church renewal. He had called me the day before to give me the information about his flight and the time of his arrival. And so I got to the airport that Saturday afternoon in plenty of time. I had his photo in my pocket. I had used it in our publicity and in our promotion for that special emphasis. And so I stationed myself there in the terminal close to that carousel where his baggage would be retrieved. I'm watching there and the little digital sign on top of the carousel says that the flight had arrived and in a few moments, it noted that the baggage was now being brought out. So I'm looking at all of these gentlemen making their way down the corridor, probably hundreds of them, 
And from time to time, I look at the little photo in my pocket. And I'm assuming that just momentarily, my guest and my new friend will be there. Several minutes uh, lapsed, and I had still not seen my guest. And so I walked over to the carousel and began to look closely at the photo and at men picking up their baggage. I even went to a couple of fellows and said, Don, the man's first name. And they said, no. So rather embarrassed, I just moved back and kept waiting and waiting. And finally, it seemed that all the baggage had been collected and still I had not seen or met my new friend. So almost in desperation, I turned and looked around that vast terminal and I saw a fellow against the wall with his suitcase on the floor and he's casually reading a newspaper. And to tell you the truth, he did not look like a preacher. And so I walked over and I said to this fellow, Don, and he said, yes, and you must be Bob. And to my great relief, I shook his hand energetically and uh, assisted him with the baggage as we walked toward the parking pavilion. And as we walked and chatted, I found myself thinking, well, Don, you surely don't look like your picture. The Bible is God's photo album. Indeed, it contains many and various pictures of what we should look like as the children of God. And in the New Testament, the scriptures teach us that as Christians, we should be conforming more and more to the image of the Lord Jesus. And our scripture lesson from Matthew 28, from the very lips of Christ, we are told what the Christian church should look like. Yet, brothers and sisters, when many look today at the postmodern church, they are prone to say, if not to think, you don't look like your picture. Indeed, there is often a noticeable difference between the postmodern church and its biblical portrait. If we're going to look more and more like our biblical image, then there are certain things that we must be willing to do. First of all, I suggest that if we're going to look like our picture, and especially as painted by the Lord Jesus, we must be willing to reclaim and to exercise divine authority. To those early disciples and perhaps others, the Lord Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now in the original tongue, the word that Jesus used for authority is the Greek word exousia. That word denotes the sovereign right of Jesus to use absolute power. Indeed, for the Lord Jesus, there is nothing outside or beyond the sovereign power of God. The one who spoke these words, Jesus of Nazareth, is he who died on a Roman cross. It is he who conquered death and defeated the grave. The one who spoke these words to the early church is none other than the one who overcame the forces of evil and darkness and victoriously arose from the dead. And so the gospel from one page to the other, from front to bottom, from front to end, is the one who exercised the authority, the very exousia of God. In every dimension of Jesus' life and ministry, there is that power, that authority of God. For instance, the scriptures teach us that Jesus taught as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Jesus exercised that authority of God in healing all manners of disease and illness. Jesus exercised that divine exousia as he forgave sin, as he restored people. Jesus exercised that authority even over the physical elements as he spoke to those elements and they were obedient to his word. But also as son of God, the Lord Jesus exercised that divine authority even over death and the dead. There are at least three instances in the biblical narrative where Jesus raised people from the dead. In every dimension of Jesus' life and work, there was that consistent demonstration of authority. His authority is not limited to this world. 
but indeed is cosmic in scope and nature. Did not Jesus say to those early disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Beloved, it's time that we, the postmodern church, recognized afresh the authority, the sovereign authority of the Lord Jesus. It is that authority he delegates to the church. And when the Apostle Paul is nearing his execution there in the Roman jail, he writes several brief pastoral letters. And to the little church in Philippi, perhaps his most favorite congregation, Paul penned these words as he thought about the sovereign authority of the Lord Jesus. In Philippians 2, 9 and 10, Paul writes that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I believe when human history is consummated and the Lord Jesus is revealed in accordance with what Paul has penned, every knee, every tongue will, will acknowledge the exousia of our crucified risen Savior. Tragically though for many, if not most, that confession, that acknowledgement will be too late. It will not be efficacious for salvation or eternal life. This power given to Jesus is now directed to the church, not simply as a religious institution, not merely as an ecclesiastical organization. The very exousia of God through Christ is given to the church as his continuing incarnation as his body, as his redemptive presence on earth. How I think if we, the church, could somehow capture experientially the truth that the church is none other than the literal presence of Christ on earth, continuing as his incarnation to accomplish the work and the will of God, if we could ever capture that truth it would ignite us. It would compel us. And we would see the Christian church turning this world upside down for the kingdom of God. The early church took seriously this admonition and this commission. Indeed, the book of Acts and the epistles report how the early church functioned on the basis of Jesus' authority. So it was they boldly witnessed in his name. They courageously ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. They knew that they could not face their world in their own power, in their own intellect or ingenuity. No, it was in the authority given them by the risen Christ that they functioned as his body. And indeed, as said in the book of Acts, they did turn their world upside down for the kingdom of God. How we, the postmodern church, need to reclaim that divine authority. How we need to exercise the power of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives, but also in our worship, in our witness, and in our ministry to the world. In ourselves, as talented, as gifted as we are, in ourselves, we are inadequate to face opposition, ridicule, pressures, and persecution of a sinful world hurling itself so quickly toward its own demise. It is in the power of the Holy Spirit and in obedience to the word and authority of the Lord Jesus that we are enabled to live abundantly, that we're not defeated, that we're enabled to overcome even the worst of obstacles and adversities. It is in the power of the Holy Spirit daily that from this sacred desk to your pew that we are able to live the Christian life. It is when we attempt to live the Christian life in our own wisdom, in our own skill, in our own intellect that we fail. It's not that God fails us, it is that we fail ourselves because with good intentions and noble resolve we seek to do what we think God wants us to do. But when we try it in our own ability... We're doomed before we start. In the exercise of Christ's authority, we're enabled to resist and reject all evil, 
to reject all demonic powers that would afflict, assail, and attack the church and our individual lives. Dear friends, I remind us that in our day of pseudo-sophistication, it's time that we, the church, think soberly and candidly about who and whose we are. Spiritual warfare is a reality. And at times when such verbiage is mentioned from the pulpit, the immediate response is almost ridicule. That is what the devil would have us to think and how to react. We're living in a world that is absolutely real and the consequences are eternal. We're living in a world where daily the host of evil, the powers of darkness, are attacking and assaulting the people of God. He does that to thwart us, to defeat us, to make us lose faith and hope and trust in God. Beloved, if we're going to look like our picture, the picture painted by the words of Christ and others, then it's essential that we reclaim, that we exercise that divine authority given to the church. But also, if we're going to look like our picture as painted by Christ and others, we need to return to the basic agenda of the church. On the basis of his absolute authority, on his singular sovereignty, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Whether then in the first century or today in this 21st century, this is the basic agenda, the dominant activity of the church of our Lord Jesus. It is to make disciples. We're not called to enlist new members. We're called to make disciples. That's the mission statement of our United Methodist Church. As a congregation, this is our priority. This is our mission to make disciples of the Lord Jesus for the transformation of our world. How tragic that the postmodern church often gets bogged down in petty disputes, power struggles, and secondary matters. How sad that we, the church, often allow good things to eclipse and to obscure that which is the best. There is no substitute for the church in making disciples. How tragic that often after we lead a person to faith and that person is converted, we baptize, we give the right hand of fellowship, and then we almost forget that person. In the words of Paul, a convert is simply a baby, a babe in Christ. Being a convert is not our destination. Being a convert, being a believer is simply our commencement. It's the beginning point. It's the responsibility of the church to teach, to nurture, to encourage, to equip, to empower, so that all of us as converts do become disciples. How tragic that not every convert is a disciple. Now, every disciple is surely a convert. But if we cease to grow, to develop, to mature, we're spiritual babies in the nursery. And as Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, they're still in the nursery, being nursed on milk. When Paul said to them, by now you should be out of the nursery. You should be able to eat and digest a solid diet. My prayer for this, our church, is that we will become a mature body of disciples. It is through disciples that we transform the world. It matters little to this community that we're here this morning. They expect us to be here. What matters to them is the lives we live out there, where we touch their lives with the gospel, where we encourage them with the love of Christ, where they can find the way to Christ in eternal life so that after they respond to Christ, they, like us, will become disciples. It's God's intent for us as the church, as a body of disciples, to duplicate ourselves, to reproduce ourselves. We've not been saved simply to sit and to spectate. We have been saved to serve, 
to be that divine catalyst for others coming to faith and growing themselves into mature believers. Our church must either evangelize disciples or we will fossilize. We must move from our cozy bleachers, from the safety of our huddle, to the playing field out there. If indeed we're going to fulfill this great commission before Christ comes, not to move beyond our comfort zones, not to share the gospel with others, is to risk our loss of Christian faith. And especially for the next generation. In the last 35 to 40 years, all mainline Protestant groups have diminished numerically. And at the same time, the number of those who claim no faith or nuns has increased. The church is called to be the body of Christ in reaching our community, in reaching our world for the sake of Christ. And if we're not doing that, we're losing ground. Every year in our annual conference, statistics are given. And without exception, we're constantly like other major church groups losing ground statistically that should not happen as those who take seriously what it means to follow Christ we must take the initiative we must go out there beyond where we're comfort we must seek those who need the gospel if the non-Christians in our community are not being exposed to the gospel then we aren't taking Christ into the world and thus we the church are failing to keep faith with Christ If new converts and other Christians aren't faithfully taught and nurtured and are growing in the whole counsel of God, then again we're failing. And the consequence is a lost generation, some of whom's blood will be upon us for our not being seriously committed to the Lordship of Christ. Do we look like our picture? Not as much as we should. If we look like the picture Jesus painted for us, then we will purposely reclaim and will exercise his authority, not our authority. The authority for this minister is not his opinions. It is the very word of God. The authority for the church, for the body of Christ, is not congressional legislation. It's not what is politically correct. It's not a presidential decree. It's not some social agenda. The authority for the church is none other than the Word of God, the divinely inspired Word of God. Thirdly, if we're going to look like our picture, we must be willing to release Jesus' ability. Beloved, Christ is not only with us when we gather here for worship. Rather, He is with us always, even as we scatter and go our separate ways into the world. One of the most promising, comforting verses of Holy Writ is from the lips of Christ in that last encounter when he said to those disciples and others, and lo, remember this, and lo, I am. I am with you and you and you. I am with you always, not just on Sunday. I am with you always, even through the close of the age. It is the assurance, the depth of that verse, that helps us to be bold and courageous and committed. We live our lives not based on our feelings, but on our faith in the Lord Jesus, who is none other than Son of God, Son of Man, and Savior of the world. And He is with us constantly, consistently, always. The success or failure of our fulfilling this great commission does not depend upon our personal ability, our credentials, our skills, our gifts, our resources. Rather, the success of this verse depends upon our availability to the Lord Jesus and to the Holy Spirit of God. Sometimes when we're called, we almost instinctively react with, I'm not able to do that, I can't do that. And that is a worldly conditioning response. When God calls us, that call validates that in Him we can do it. It's not our ability that determines our success. Instead, it is our availability to God. And every day, fellow believer, we should submit our lives to the Lord 
asking his will to be revealed and for his will to be our will. And if his will calls us into a particular role or function, we can do it. Not dependent upon self, but dependent upon him and his grace and his mercy. Through the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus is with us constantly. He is with us all the time. He is with us irrespective of our ability or our disability, irrespective of our success or our failure. He is with us irrespective of our faith or our fears. He is with us constantly. And thanks be to God for his faithfulness. He is the Lord Emmanuel, always with us, always within us, always for us. And so Paul can write in Romans 8, If God be for us, who, including the devil, can be against us? Thanks be to God that Christ does not send us out alone, but that when he sends us out, when he commissions us, he also accompanies us. He is with us in covenant. He tabernacles with us. He communes with us along all the way. And through the course of our earthly sojourn, there are undoubtedly hills and valleys. There are numerous dark nights of the soul. Some of our congregation this very moment are going through dark nights of the soul. Many of them suffer in silence. On occasion they share with the pastor and others. But in most of their waking hours, they're struggling and suffering. The Lord Jesus is there with them. And in his strength, they become strong. I've learned and many of you have learned, we are at our best spiritually during those dark nights of the soul. When I know and you know that within ourselves we're totally inadequate. We're too weak. We're too frail. We're too selfish. But in that dark night, we throw ourselves totally upon the grace and mercy of God, asking God to help us, and he does. And through that experience, through that struggle, that sorrow, that strife, we grow tremendously in our faith and in our commitment to the Lord Jesus. Beloved, if we would look like our biblical picture, there are some things we must be willing to do. To reclaim his authority. To exercise his authority. Not the pastor's authority. Not the authority of any ecclesiastical group. The power, the authority of the Lord God. God will honor his word. He honors our faithfulness. Our obedience to his word. Then it is to return to the basic agenda. Making disciples. Not trying to be popular or congenial to appease a secular culture, but to make disciples for the glory of God and for the transformation of our humanity. And then daily to release his, his ability to release in our lives and through our lives the very person of the Lord Jesus. It's my prayer that increasingly our church, this church, will look more and more like the picture of our Lord Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.